Mark, thank you. Our gospel lesson is from the first chapter of the, according to St. Mark, verses 9 through 18. Would you please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel? At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And at once the Spirit sent him out into the desert. And he was in the desert forty days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels attended him. And after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, Follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. The Holy Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Well, our lesson today contains great wisdom and it's a timeless lesson that have happened near Capernaum where Jesus spent a lot of time healing and teaching and performing miracles now Bethsaida was a fishing village on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee and it was the hometown of Peter and his brother Andrew and one day Jesus met those two brothers who were fishermen as he walked along the seashore. And the lives of Simon and his brother Andrew were about to change forever. When Jesus spoke 11 simple yet powerful words to them. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Let's dig into that. Let's go a little deeper and see if we could discover what it means for you. You see, Jesus chose ordinary people, ordinary, ordinary people as his disciples. And every day, those two men, those two fishermen, they worked casting their nets, mending nets, hauling fish into boats, just like the fishermen do right out here on the Gulf of Mexico. And Jesus saw potential in those two men. And he didn't wait for them to become scholars or religious leaders. He met them right where they were. Because he could transform the ordinary into the extraordinary and then tap into what they could become. You see, Simon became one of Jesus' closest disciples. Jesus would later name him Peter, which means rock. So, leaving behind his career and his home to follow Jesus, Peter had a unique blend of strength and weakness, like we all do. Yet despite lacking formal education or training, God called Peter to a higher purpose, to become a fisher of men. And Peter was excited about that. In his relationship with Jesus, he learned firsthand as he witnessed miracles. And his commitment to Jesus was unwavering. 
Yet Peter was outspoken. He was headstrong, often speaking before thinking. He would blurt out his thoughts and his emotions, which made him take fearless actions. You remember like when he stepped out of that boat to walk out on the water? Yeah, that's Peter. You see, those qualities are both an asset and a liability. But they made Peter a natural leader among the disciples. And his time with Jesus transformed him from an uneducated, sometimes fearful man into a courageous apostle of Jesus Christ. And as Peter developed more, a more godly, Christ-like character, his thinking became more effective. See, by sharpening his reasoning skills, he was able to make better decisions. Even when faced with uncertainty, he added his leadership to it. You remember last week we learned that Peter was witnessing the transfiguration of Jesus up on the mountaintop? Remember that? Well, then Peter was in Jerusalem at Pentecost. That was a pivotal time in the early church. It marked the proclamation of Jesus' resurrection and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the believers. And the effect of Peter's sermon was enormous. 3,000 people were converted that day. And Peter played a crucial role in establishing the early church. He reached out to both Jews and Christians. And when Jesus told Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom to heaven, it symbolized the authority given to Peter in the early church. For 15 years, he was the most prominent figure in the church in Jerusalem up to the time of his departure from Jerusalem. And his leadership was crucial during the early years of the Christian community. You see, Peter's commitment, his excitement, his outspokenness, his courage, together with his weaknesses and his impulsive speech and, and an occasional lack of judgment, those were his strengths. With all his flaws, Peter became a vessel of God's hope, a key figure in spreading the gospel. And by calling Peter to join him, Jesus changed Peter's secular life into a sacred mission. He didn't blend the two. He separated them. Just as a follower of Jesus today, you're called to be in the world, but yet not a part of it. You see, your daily work, whether you're in an office or workshop, home, your life becomes sacred when you dedicate it to God's purposes. And you can fish for people right where you are. Jesus promised to make those men fishers of men, not by teaching them new fishing techniques. He transformed their hearts. And it was a miraculous transformation. Because as they followed him, they witnessed the healings, the miracles. They were there at his resurrection. You see, their nets were no longer catching fish. They had developed a way to draw souls to God. Their ordinary lives became extraordinary vessels of grace. Now remember, your life does not have to be ordinary. But your life can be filled with extraordinary moments if you have a remarkable purpose by being an instrument of God's grace. That's what it's about. You have to have it. 
And to have it, you must surrender your will to God. You must have a deep, open relationship with Jesus Christ, allowing Him to guide your actions and your decisions. Now, let's explore that a little further. Surrendering to God, surrendering to God, means letting go of your own desires, your own ambitions. It means you're acknowledging you can't do this alone. You need help. You can't live your life by yourself. You're dependent on God's grace. So surrendering allows you to rearrange yourself to make space for God in your life. Which means you develop a closer relationship with Jesus. You spend more time with Him in prayer. You study His Word. You look forward to being in His presence. And when you draw near to Him, He's going to transform you from the inside out. Your heart will be ready to receive His power and pour out His love. And when you surrender and stay connected to Jesus, your actions will follow His will. You will become an instrument of His love, His forgiveness, and His compassion. You see, your words and your deeds will reflect Him and you're going to make a strong impression on those who are around you. Because God's grace is beginning to flow through you when you allow Him to work in you and through you. And it's not all about your effort. You can't do it alone. It's about His power. And you will receive it abundantly. And it will help you be a blessing to those around you. You need to accept that you are God's instrument, not the source. That you have become a vessel of God's grace, a channel through which His love and His mercy and His grace can flow. A vessel that brings light to a world in need. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.8, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. In this journey, when you admit your weaknesses and you know His strength has made you strong in your weakness, your humility is going to keep you open to God's leading, because it's in your human weakness that you find strength, physically, emotionally, intellectually. Yet it's in your weakness where you find a different kind of strength. You know, weakness is the soil where courage grows. Did you notice in our lesson, Jesus called those men while they were working? Well, he may be calling you during your daily routines. Are you open to hearing his voice? You see, hearing God's voice means having a sense of God. It doesn't necessarily mean hearing clear sounds. It means the many ways in which you may sense a message from God. And when you talk about hearing God's voice, you're not referring to a physical hearing situation. It's about sensing God. You're having words or phrases that enter into your consciousness through your prayer or through your quiet reflection Words or phrases that may happen unexpectedly and startle you with their meaning. 
You see, God can be blunt. He can be direct with you. Because sometimes God's words are straightforward, much like the teachings of Jesus and the Gospels. They can be swift and immediately. They are there in front of you, catching you off guard. But not every thought or phrase that pops into your mind during prayer is from God. You must decide. Is it your imagination? Is what you are hearing in line with God's truth? You must decide that. You hear God's voice when you listen for Him. And your desire for answers can sometime lead you astray. You see, nonverbal communication can be powerful and Expressive. It goes beyond words. But Jesus' disciples, they heard his actual voice when he called them to follow him. Not as perfect vessels. He perfects imperfect ones. Your weaknesses become opportunities for his grace. And your work, whether as a teacher, an engineer, a parent, or just as a friend can have an impact on others' lives for eternity. It's when you invite others to follow Him that you're following Him. Will you leave your own self-reliance and embrace His calling? Our text today, Mark 1, 17, you want to take a look at that, you see, Jesus still calls ordinary people, just like you and me, for extraordinary purposes. He invites you to fish for people. He wants you to cast wide the net of his love and draw souls into his kingdom. Listen for his call. Knowing that in your life, every day, you can make an eternal difference. Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Do you remember how I challenged you a couple of weeks ago to fill this church by Easter? Do you remember that? Well, you don't. I'm going to do it again. I said, let's fill the church by Easter. Remember that? Say it again with me. Now, let's fill the church by Easter. Let that inspire you to respond to your calling so that you will go fishing and cast your nets wide, drawing people to the Savior. Amen.